remember that because of Solomon's rebellion against God and Israel's idolatrous behavior, God had divided the kingdom into two. There was the northern kingdom, um, often referred to as Israel. Um, it, considered, it consisted of the majority of the tribes, uh, ten out of the twelve. And then there was the southern kingdom, which was referred to as Judah, made up of Judah and Benjamin. Now, Solomon himself, he died a few chapters back, uh, I think it was chapter 11, and his son Rehoboam took over the throne after him. Now, Rehoboam had refused to listen to the people. Um, they had asked that he would rescind the heavy tax burden and uh, some other loads that Solomon had placed upon them. He also did not move to correct uh, his father's allowance of worship of foreign gods. Uh, had Rehoboam have repented and, and made God honoring changes, things might have turned out far different. But he did not. And so God was dividing the kingdom. And God sent a prophet to Jeroboam, an Ephraimite, to inform him that he would be king of the northern kingdom. Now God told him that if he himself would honor the Lord and obey his commandments, then God would make his kingdom strong like that of David. But Jeroboam did not honor the Lord nor his commandments. Now, we deviated a bit from Second Chronicles a few weeks ago, and we went to First Kings, which gave us more of the narrative of Jeroboam and, and his follies. <laughs> and then we uh, were with Jeroboam for God's warning to him and, and to the northern kingdom. We moved them back to Second Chronicles, and the story turned back to Solomon's heir, Rehoboam. Uh, the text there described how God punished the uh, evil Rehoboam and Judah with an invasion by the Egyptian pharaoh Shishak. Now Shishak took 156 cities in Israel and in Judah, but when the Egyptians got as far as Jerusalem, 2 Chronicles 12 told us that the prophet Shemiah came with a message from God. He said, thus says the Lord, you have forsaken me and therefore I also have left you in the hand of Shishak. Rehoboam and his officers humbled themselves before the Lord, and God stopped Shishak from destroying them. However, the kingdom was now subject to Shishak and had to pay him tribute. And as part of the deal, Shishak was given gold from the temple and from the king's palace, including the 500 golden shields that Solomon had made uh, for the palace. Now, after the invasion of Shishak, which was probably somewhere around 925 BC, Rehoboam reigned for 12 more years and died somewhere in the vicinity of 913 BC. That invasion had brought them to repent, and if Rehoboam had continued to walk with the Lord and to lead his people to be faithful to God's covenant, um, the Lord would have done great things for him. As it was, his sins and the sins of the people who followed him left the nation weaker, poorer, and in bondage. Now, we left uh, the last chapter understanding that after his death, Rehoboam's son, Avi Yam, uh, reigned in his place. In, in the entire history of the northern kingdom, there, there's no godly king. Um, and the northern kingdom in 722 BC fell to the Assyrians. The people were deported and the northern kingdom really disappeared from history. Um, but those tribes of the northern kingdom were still represented as there were families from the north who had settled in Judah. So they're not disappeared. Um, they're not the lost tribes, right? They're still there. Um, it's just the northern kingdom was wiped off. Um, now, in the history of the southern kingdom, there were only a few good kings. There were, um, the few godly were uh, Asa or Asa, uh, Jehoshaphat, um, Joash, um, uh, Amaziah, Azariah, uh, Yotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. But Judah also endured the rule of many um, wicked kings. Um, they had eight good kings, twelve wicked kings. Um, they followed Solomon's example and, and permitted pagan worship in the land. Eventually the southern kingdom would experience a series of deportations itself from the land uh, to Babylon. Now, over time and under the weight of God's punishment, the people began to repent 
and a remnant returned from Babylon to the promised land. Even though some were obedient while others were wicked, the kings in the southern line were all themselves descendants of David. And God's covenant promise to Israel's greatest king, David, was faithfully kept by the Lord, despite the faithfulness, or faithlessness, I should say, of the kingdom's kings. The return of a remnant of Israel from Babylon reestablished the Jewish homeland to await then the promised Messiah. And it was to these returning exiles that what we are studying now, Ezra wrote in these chronicles. So let's pray and let's dig in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Um, We thank you that you know each of us by name. Lord, we open up your word this morning desiring to hear from you. Not man's word or man's wisdom. We desire your words and your wisdom. So we ask that you would soften our hearts to receive what you have for us from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So starting with verse 1. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Aviah became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel, of Gibeah. Now, this introduction to Aviam that Second Chronicles gives us, um, when compared to the introduction we have in First Kings 15, we discover these two things are starkly different. Here's what what uh, what uh, First Kings tells us: In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Aviam became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacah the granddaughter of Avi Shalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. So Ezra in, in Second Chronicles leaves out what First Kings 15 verses 3 through 5 says. So let's consider some of this information that we have. The northern kingdom of Israel had nine dynasties in about 250 years. Instead of multiple dynasties, the southern kingdom maintained the Davidic dynasty for 350 years. That was the dynasty from which the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, would come. As promised, prophesied, and is borne out by the genealogies that we have in the Gospels. Now, the southern kingdom of Judah had plenty of faults, but it was identified with the true and living God. They practiced uh, authorized worship in the temple, and they had kings who who came from David's family. Most importantly, God was faithful to his covenant with David. Two of these kings are named in these chapters, in 1 Kings and in 2 Chronicles, this chapter and the next. Um, We have Aviah and we have uh, Asa. Now we start with Aviah, we'll get to Asa um, really in the next chapter. It was in the 18th year of the reign of Jeroboam in the northern kingdom that Rehoboam's son took over the throne of the southern kingdom. Aviah, whose name means God is my father, had brothers from among whom Rehoboam groomed him to be the one to take over. Second Chronicles 11 verse 22 says, Rehoboam appointed Aviah, the son of Machah, as chief to be leader among his brothers, for he intended to make him king. Now back in uh, chapter 14 of 1 Kings, Aviah is called by a different name, Aviyam. And this might have been an attempt of the original author to distinguish the two Aviyas that we've had recently in the text. There was Aviyah um, who died, the, the son of Jeroboam, and then there was this Aviyah, the son of Rehoboam. So the idea is that that Hebrew letter, the final Hebrew letter of the name, the, the Mame, was added to insinuate possession. Um, in other words, it changed his name to mean something more like our Aviyah, as opposed to their Aviyah. 
But as far as Second Chronicles go, Ezra preserves the original name Ahiah. So Rehoboam's son, Ahiah, reigned over Judah for only three years. That was probably during the years 913 to 910 BC. And he was not exactly a godly man. He was from David's line by both of his parents. His father was Rehoboam, son of Solomon, the son of David in Bathsheba. His mother was Maachah, granddaughter of Absalom. He should have known how to behave as king from the example of David and the downfall of the rebellious Absalom. But as verse 3 of 1 Kings tells us, he didn't have David's heart for the Lord. Now, he talked about this, or we talked about this just a bit last week in regards to Rehoboam, of whom chapter 12 had said, and he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Which was a way of saying he was not determined to follow the Lord. Very simply, and and like many believers today, Rehoboam believed God but was worldly, seeking friendship with the world over fellowship with God. And as we see something, uh, we see something similar here this morning as we study with Avia. Um, he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God. In other words, like his father, his devotion was divided. He was worldly, and God would discipline him. However, we also know from 1 Kings 15 and verse 4 that for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem. Now that's a very interesting phrase there. God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. And the gist of it is how, well, I like the way that David Gutzik puts this. David Gutzik says, God preserved the dynasty of David in Jerusalem for the sake of David and not because of the character or quality of David's descendants. In other words, God was faithful to his covenant despite the unfaithfulness of people. What he has declared, what he has covenanted, what he has promised will happen. In regards to New Testament believers, and as we talked about quite a bit last week, God is faithful even though believers are not. Now, back to that phrase, lamp in Jerusalem. While the, the word that is translated as lamp, um, spelled out uh, nun yod resh, um, or near, it can also mean a plowed furrow. And that is the direction that the Targum actually takes it. Now, Targum is an ancient Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible. And the implication then is that David plowed or prepared the way for his successors to flourish spiritually. But of course, they failed to do that. Now, in regards to the translation as we have it here, near refers not just to a lamp, but to a lamp on a lamp stand. And this, of course, is intended to draw our thoughts toward the menorah, the golden lampstand that lit up the holy place of the tabernacle and then also the temple. And the lampstand points to the ministry of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. So again, in God's faithfulness to his covenant with David, the way was preserved for the Messiah. So then God maintained David's dynasty. And we'll see this more fleshed out with Aviah's son and heir Asa, whose heart was wholly true to the Lord all his days. And to make sure that we don't Uh, miss the point of of this being God's faithfulness. Jeremiah, who I believe wrote 1 Kings, said in chapter 5, David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. It's a great reminder of God's faithfulness to provide our Savior Jesus. It's also an inspiration to believers who might feel that our sins put our salvation at risk or that sins make it impossible for us to move on and grow. And that's because David and Israel make a great example of God's faithfulness. 
despite man's unfaithfulness. Now Ezra says that Aviah's mother was uh, Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeon. Jeremiah in 1 Kings says his mother was Maacah, daughter of Avi Shalom, who is Absalom. So we have a name difference here. But also, how is it that Avia had two mothers? Um, one, Micaiah, according to Ezra, and the other, Maacah, according to Jeremiah. Well, it's, it's not so much a problem as it is a riddle that is created by Hebrew vocabulary. You see, in Hebrew, the word for daughter, bat, is also used for granddaughter. So Avia's mother was both Uriel's daughter and Absalom's granddaughter. And as far as the name goes, well, the name Machiah is simply a variant of Machah. Um, Abs- the way that, that Avi Shalom is a variant of Absalom. So nothing's really known about this Uriel. Um, and Absalom, of course, you guys know that name, probably recognize it. It was the, the son of David that attempted to take over the throne. And understanding this means what seemed to be confusing actually becomes some means of clarity about who this mother of Aviyah was, at least in regards to the main point. However, there are still questions about the proper family structure given the information that we have in Scripture. I'm I'm sure this, this made sense to Jeremiah, it made sense to Ezra, but being as far removed as we are now, there are still some questions in regards to the specifics. But again, the main point is that God is preserving the line of David through whom God brings the promised Messiah into the world. Now, as we continue on, Ezra expounds on what 1 Kings stated in just one verse. That verse in 1 Kings 15, and there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. In our text, Ezra says, and there was war between Aviah and Jeroboam. So Jeremiah in 1 Kings lumps Aviah under Rehoboam. But Ezra is going to tell us more about this warring between the two that continued into Aviah's reign. So let's read on, verse 3. Aviah set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. Jeroboam also drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men, mighty men of valor. So Avia's father, Rehoboam, had apparently kept this running war kind of going with Jeroboam, or perhaps Jeroboam kept this running war going with Rehoboam. And then Avia carried, carried on the tradition during his very brief three-year reign. Now, as I've stated before, when we have these huge round numbers, like 400,000 soldiers and 800,000 soldiers, it's not intended that we take these as literal numbers. Remember, the authors of Scripture used all kinds of literary devices. And one of those devices they used was exaggeration in order to really make an emphasis, to, re- to make their point. And the numbers here are more than likely exaggerated to let us know that this was no small skirmish and that a lot was riding on the outcome of this war. But also, the idea here is that Jeroboam's army outnumbered Rehoboam's army two to one. Or I should say Aviyah's army two to one. But that is the the fact that's most important as far as the events of this chapter goes. Now, as you may remember, back in chapter 11, after the breaking apart of Israel into Judah and Israel, Rehoboam initially prepared to go to war with Jeroboam and and the north. But a prophet named Shemaiah came to Rehoboam with the word of the Lord that he was not to go up or fight against your brethren. And upon hearing this, Rehoboam obeyed the words of the Lord. But it seems that that Rehoboam was not faithful to his original conviction and at some point began to war with Jeroboam or it may have been more Jeroboam as the aggressor in these things than Rehoboam. And whatever the case, this warring just continued on with King Aviyah. So 
then in our text, the story begins by telling us that, that this, this, these probably what was small skirmishes leading up to this has now erupted between the kingdom of Israel led by Jeroboam and the kingdom of Judah led by, by Aviah into this battle that would be the final cataclysmic battle if everything went according to Jeroboam's plan. However, because the, the um, template text, the, the Orlaga of 1 Kings 15, says, and there was war between Aviam and Jeroboam, while 2 Chronicles 12 says, there was wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. You know, this is obvious, obviously a continuation of the warring that they had probably become quite accustomed to. Um, now, Rehoboam's influence shows in the actions of Aviyah. We have these two sides here, Israel and Judah, and neither the text of 1 Kings nor 2 Chronicles tells us which of the two it was who actually started this thing. Some say it was likely Jeroboam, others say it was likely Rehoboam. The reason for either side declaring war was probably for any reason you could think of, security reasons, um, an attempt to reunite the 12 tribes by force under one king, or perhaps an attempt to get rid of uh, the threat of, of the southern kingdom or the northern kingdom. Um, there is maybe evidence then for Jeroboam being the aggressor, and that evidence I think we'll find in the speech that we'll read in a couple of minutes here. Now, as we move on, we need to once again make note that Jeremiah in 1 Kings gives a negative assessment of Aviah. He says he walked in the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. First Kings also omits the story of Aviah's great act of faith that we're going to see here in Second Chronicles. See, for all his faults in not pushing the kingdom toward repentance and reformation, Aviah seems to have very well known his history. And he seemed as we'll see in his speech, he seemed to trust God in his covenants with Moses and David. In 1 Samuel, we see how under pressure King Saul refused to trust God, both in his presumptuousness in chapter 13 and in his disobedience then in chapter 15. And now kind of under these similar pressures, Aviah does trust God. Let's read on. Let's see how this plays out. Verse 4. Then Aviah stood on Mount uh, Zimaraim, which is in the, north, in the mountains of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, Jeroboam, and all Israel. All right, so Aviah has ascended Mount Zeramaim, which is in the Ephraimite hill country. And from this location, he addressed Jeroboam and his armies. Um, now, we have a map for that, but... Truly, the location of this mountain is uncertain. There's another screenshot that's more of a satellite view, if we could put that up as well, um, that shows three most likely locations for this, this mountain. Now, obviously, it is situated somewhere in the hill country of Ephraim, which is in the, uh, on the northern border of the Benjamite territory. The text of Joshua 18 seems to place the location near Bethel. Now, presumably, this is a a high enough location, and I say a high enough location because in Israel, when people say mount this or that, it's not what somebody living in Colorado might think of mount anything, right? These, it's like what we would think of, you know, we say Shades Mountain or whatever mountain, Oak Mountain. They're, they're high once you get to the top. You feel like they're way up there and it's going to hurt if you fall. But, you know, it's, it's not like Everest or something like that. Um, so it's high enough that, that his voice would carry a certain distance, enough for him to make the speech that we're going to see here. Um, now, it seems to me more likely that, that Aviah was not expecting all the army of Jeroboam to hear his speech. It was probably more likely um, him making this speech to Jeroboam and uh, the elders or leaders of the the uh, armies of Israel. So this, would, th this wouldn't be the first time that we've seen this kind of thing where the, the leaders of Israel would be called all Israel. 
um, because it was intended when you spoke to the leaders of Israel that they would go back to their, their various groups and say what was said, right? So that was their duty, take it back to the people. Now, that being said, a counter-argument might be that Aviah was speaking literally to Jeroboam and out towards the entire army as his speech was... The way it reads, it was intended almost as a kind of psychological warfare. Um, now, that's, uh, psychological warfare is nothing new. It's, it's not a recent invention. It's been used for a long time. Now, whichever the case, his, adri- his address here is, is given to us from Ezra reads a lot like a sermon um, in that its nature was to exhort. Now, to exhort is to strongly encourage or urge someone to do something. And you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of pastors use exhortation by any means that they, that they find necessary. But uh, a, a lot of pastors are, are teaching baby Christians. Um, I look out here this morning, um, and I see a lot of mature Christians. So I prefer to teach uh, the text of the Bible and let y'all understand, or let y'all hear what the exhortation that's spoken to your heart is from it. I want y'all to hear the actual word, not my word so much. So, in his speech, Avia appeals to the northern tribes to reunify under a Davidic rule because the kingdom of the Lord has been given to David and his descendants. Let's read this speech. Verse 5. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever to him and his sons by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. Then worthless rogues gathered to him and strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and inexperienced and could not withstand them. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hand of the sons of David. And you are a great multitude, and with you are the calves, the gold calves, which Jeroboam made for you as gods. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests like the peoples of other lands? So that whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may be a priest of things that are not God's. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites attend to their duties. And they burn to the Lord every morning and every evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense, They also set the showbread in order on the pure gold table and the lampstand of gold with its lamps to burn every evening. For we keep the command of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Now look, God himself is with us as our head and his priests with sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. Now, in the text of the New King James Version, there was that phrase, by a covenant of salt. This, is not, this isn't a reference to, and, and we, these days we may think of, of, of uh, in a marriage ceremony, sometimes you, you might see a, a salt covenant made between the, the, the husband and the, the bride. This isn't referring to that, though it, it is applicable, and that's, it's kind of the source of where that kind of thing comes from. But this is a reference to the salt being mixed in with the sacrifices, such as we read about in Leviticus 2 and in Numbers 18. The salt of this offering spoke in regards to a covenant of purity, of preservation, but also of expense, because salt was a commodity back then. So it was a symbol of a pure covenant, um, an enduring covenant, and a valuable covenant, which is why some people do the salt thing as part of their their marriage ceremony. But strictly speaking, Rehoboam would would have been speaking of the symbolism of salt in regards to God's covenant being pure, valuable, and not to be set to the side as something old-fashioned. So the idea is in regards to God's covenant with David, but also applicable to all of God's promises, including the eternal security of believers. 
Now, on one hand, it's as if Avhiah is shaming Jeroboam and Israel for continuing in their division from uh, Judah and the Davidic monarchy. But also, we have the psychological warfare side of things, questioning how they expect to be victorious over Judah in light of God's covenant. It says, if they are then fighting against God's covenant that he made to the house of David, which was perpetual, and against God who is faithful to all his promises. And so we continue the psychological warfare then with the speech as, as Aviah seeks to cause dissension and separate Jeroboam from his troops. He wants to make the troops question what they're being told to do. And he does that by characterizing Jeroboam's relationship as rebellion against Solomon. Remember that Jeroboam was formerly promoted to an important position under Solomon. Implicitly, Jeroboam has rebelled then against Solomon, but then also against God since God has given the kingdom to David and his descendants. Now, the original accusation against Solomon by Jeroboam was very legitimate. The heavy taxes, the building projects, Solomon's extravagant lifestyle, all these things had made it very difficult for the regular people. And then, of course, Rehoboam responds to the complaints of Jeroboam and the elders by saying he'll make it even harder for them. And let's not forget that God, command, God condemned the idolatry, the extravagances, and the rebellion of Solomon in the kingdom under Solomon and chose Jeroboam to rule the ten tribes as a separate kingdom. Those are the events as they happened, but Avia, he applies a little bit of spin here. He goes on to defend his father's role in the split of the monarchy, acknowledging in verse 7 that he was young and inexperienced at the time. Jeroboam, on the other hand, surrounded himself with worthless rogues. Literally lawless, good-for-nothing men. And those scoundrels aided and abetted him as the mastermind of the whole coup that was to follow. Now, there's another view of verse 7 that is found in a small number of texts. And that that view is interesting because it says that the worthless rogues of verse 7 were the young advisors who directed Rehoboam to meet the complaints of Jeroboam with such a callous response. In other words, Rehoboam, who was young and inexperienced, was convinced by those lawless advisors to respond harshly. So it wasn't entirely Rehoboam's fault. So then according to that view, Avia offered to accept on behalf of his father some of the blame for what had happened. Thus, this was a, a play by Avia to attempt to soften the hearts of, uh, of the opposing soldiers toward Judah thus making it perhaps easier for them to defect over to Judah. Now, if that's the case, this speech is quite brilliant as far as political speeches go. Now, looking again at the text, we find that this speech contrasts the the faithfulness and loyalty of Afihah with the rebellion and disloyalty of Jeroboam in two particular issues, the Davidic covenant and God's temple in Jerusalem. Now, we've talked about Avia's accusation against Jeroboam regarding the Davidic covenant and God's faithfulness. So look closely at the last part of verse 8 and then verse 9. You are a great multitude, and with you, with you are the gold calves which Jeroboam made for you as gods. The implication of that is either that they have brought these two golden calves with them as the uh, Israel, Israelite army used to carry the, the, uh, um, the Ark of the Covenant with them into battle. Or the idea is that, hey, look what y'all have done. Y'all have set up two idols, two golden calves in your territory. They are with you. 
Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests like the peoples of other lands, so that whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may be a priest of things that are not God's? The second half of Avia's speech contrasts Jeroboam's forsaking of the Lord's temple and, and banishment of the Levitical priesthood with Avia's compliance with the Mosaic law related to the the proper worship, the temple worship of God. And like the previous part of the speech, there is a rhetorical question that is now presented. And that rhetorical question, it it has to be answered with the acknowledgement that Israel's in the wrong. And the evidence presented includes the creation of the pseudo-priesthood, the casting out of legitimate priests, and of course, the golden calves which Jeroboam made for you as gods. And then in verse 10, Avia builds his argument that they should defect by saying, but as for us, and then the punchline, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken Him. And then in verse 12, God is with us. So then it is a special kind of folly on behalf of Jeroboam, to come against Judah, because that is to fight against the Lord. So then, Israel can choose not to fight against the Lord. And as for Ezra's reading audience, God is faithful, and has brought them back to the land from the exile that they were in, and they too can move beyond the past, and be united and obedience to God, and dependence on God's faithfulness to His promises. And in that way, the restoration of Israel would succeed. Let's read on. Verse 13, But Jeroboam caused an ambush to go around behind them. So they were in front of Judah, and the ambush was behind them. And when Judah looked around, to their surprise, the battle line was at both front and rear. And they cried out to the Lord, and the priests sounded the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all Israel before Aphihah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. Then Aphihah and his people struck them with a great slaughter, so 500,000 choice men of Israel fell slain. Thus the children of Israel were subdued at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. And Aviah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages, Jeshanah with its villages, Ephraim with its villages. So Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Aviah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. Now, verse 13 here in the New King James Version, it reads a little strange, at least it did to me when I was reading it, it reads a little strangely, and so I went to another translation to see how it put it. And the, the New English translation, I think, made it a bit more clear. And it goes like this, it says, Now Jeroboam had sent some men to ambush the Judahite army from behind. The main army was in front of the Judahite army, the ambushers were behind it. So Jeroboam has positioned an ambush in the rear of Avia's army while the main army of Israel were out in front of Judah's army. Now, as we've noted before, the authors of the books of the Bible, they were not practicing automatic writing. They were not channeling or possessed by the Holy Spirit and then suddenly you know, came to and there was this book before them. Instead, they wrote as they would normally write meaning they wrote the text, edited the text, rewrote the text as necessary, and the sovereignty of God worked it out to where it all came together as inspired Scripture and fits perfectly with the rest of what we call the canon of Scripture. Now, given this, the various books and letters bear marks of the time periods in which they were written. And so, the account of this battle contains elements that are familiar to many other Old Testament narratives of of warfare. And recognizing those familiar elements helps 
to under, helps us to it helps to inform our understanding of this text. So then, the elements that we find here are a speech or, or something to establish the error of one and the righteousness of the other, the reminder of a promise made by God, the description of the strategy of the ambush. That is uh, the description of one of the two enemies making moves to have an advantage over the other. It almost comes across as, as, as being a kind of underhanded move by one and thus kind of establishes in our minds that there's, there's one more righteous than the other. However, it, it's a wise and logical battle plan. So, you know, God commanded Joshua to take the, the, the city of uh, Ai the very same way, right? Um, now also, the sounds of battle that we read about here, the shouts, the trumpets to signal the troops into action, they might remind us of Israel's taking of Jericho from Joshua 6. And also the crying out to the Lord to fight on behalf of His people. These things come together to create a, a motif that fits the biblical pattern for what we might call a holy war in Scripture. And ultimately, the narrative will then shift to God being the divine warrior siding on and saving His people as an act of faithfulness to His promises. So these are things that you'll recognize repeated in the Old Testament text over and again, signaling that something big is getting ready to happen. So the initial feeling of the text is that Avian Judah, 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 Judah <laughs> and Judah are, are they're, they're definitely going to be defeated. I mean, you know, you got twice the army that they have coming against them, and now they, they've, they've got this, this pincher type movement against them, one in the back, one in the front. The speech seemed to have been completely ineffective, at least to the armies of Israel. It may have been effective, you know, for the morale of Judah, the armies of Judah that were hearing it. It was certainly meaningful to Ezra's readers later on, and it's meaningful to me. But Avia was, was caught by surprise with this ambush. And, and the ambush created what we might describe as a, that, that pincher's type uh, attack. Jeroboam's troops in the, in the back, in the front of Avia's army. It's a dire situation. And with this, we have them crying out to God for his divine intervention. Otherwise, they knew they were undone. And so the battle shout from Judah is a cry for help from the Lord. And I just want to say the Lord did not show up. The Lord took action. But He did not show up. In my prep for today, I, I, was, I was listening to another pastor teach through this same text. But it was a, it was a topical message rather than, than verse by verse. Um, and I have to admit, I, I suspected where it would eventually lead. And I was right. The, the, the pastor used this text to create a doctrine. A doctrine of how we can get God to show up. And of course, where he ended was exactly where I'm sure you suspect that God shows up when we sow large seeds of tithe money. Now that's, that's what moves God to show up. Amen. That's, no. <laughs> it, it's, it is a terrible misuse of Scripture and the desire is to manipulate people. Now, in order for a doctrine to be biblical, it has to be clearly taught in Scripture. And there are so many today who are creating unbiblical doctrines by twisting Scripture to make the Bible thing say things it does not say. And by the way, this gets perpetuated when we go out and we buy their books and we hand them over to others. 
the phrase used so often these days, and then God showed up, or hey, you know, God showed up today. It's it's catchy, it's cute. But what it propagates is this idea that God shows up by formula. And that very quickly becomes God is here when we're good enough. And, and then eventually it becomes I'm saved when my works are good enough. And when I sin, I'm in danger of losing my salvation. Now, I submit to you that in our text, nor at any time in Scripture or in our lives, did God show up or not show up. He is, from His perspective, He is, I am. We do not manipulate God, nor do we summon Him. Rather, He is faithful to His his promises, He is faithful to His covenants. And if we keep this in mind, then we look at Avia's speech and recognize that there is obviously belief in the promises of God there. And his speech reminds his own army of this fact. God's intervention had nothing to do with any righteousness or faithfulness on the part of Israel. It had everything to do with his faithfulness. And so God acts against Jeroboam and his army, routing the forces of the northern kingdom. And in this we find the greatest of the motifs of this text. And that is this. Overwhelming odds present no problem for those who belong to the Lord and rely on Him. The word rely, as we see it in verse 18, means to lean on something or someone in the sense of trust. In the text here, it foreshadows King Asa's own prayer to the Lord, which we'll see soon uh, in chapter 14. But I want to read that to you. Faced by an overwhelming army, Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you. And in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Back in our text, though Judah is outnumbered two to one and outflanked on the battlefield, Israel loses more than half its military force. And those who remain flee. Now look at verse 18 again, that phrase, Lord God of, our, of their fathers. Um, this, this reminded Ezra's original readers that, that God has this pattern of faithfulness. God has physically saved His people again and again. In verse 19, we find that this was such a victory that Aphiah captured cities from Israel. The fact that they took Bethel is significant. That's because that was one of the two great cult centers of Jeroboam's kingdom. And Avia taking it meant the cessation of that calf cult worship there for at least a period of time. Now by the time of Jehu, the calf cult has been reestablished in Bethel. But at least for a time. Verse 20. So Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Avia, and the Lord struck him and he died. But Aviha grew mighty, married 14 wives, and begot 22 sons and 16 daughters. I'm exhausted just reading that. Now the rest of the acts of Aviha, his ways and his sayings, are written in the annals of the prophet Edo. So Jeroboam sustained such heavy losses at this battle that his capacity for any further attacks was removed. Now, Jeroboam actually outlived Aphiah. It doesn't sound like it from the text, but Jeroboam actually outlives Aphiah. So it seems odd for Ezra to report his death then prior to Aphiah. But Ezra reports it first so that it's understood 
that Jeroboam's eventual death was an act of divine judgment. The text in verse 20 says, the Lord struck him and he died. The verb here for strike down, uh, nagaf, is the, the same verb translated struck in the report of God's deliverance of Jeroboam and his army into the hands of Judah in verse 15. It's a term that's often used of a, a blow that's brought by God as a divine warrior bringing judgment on rebellious and sinful people. It's also used in regard to divine plagues. So Ezra also reported Jeroboam's death first in order to end with a, a statement of blessing upon the king of Judah. And that is the statement that he grew in strength, had many wives and very many children. As well as in chapter 14, verse 1, the report that he had a son then to take the throne after him. And as we'll see next week, a time of peace followed. So we found two important truths for us in this text this morning. God is faithful to his promises. And there are many promises made by God to believers. Some very important ones concerning salvation and security. Eternal salvation for those who believe Jesus. Believers are indwelt and sealed by, the, by God, the Holy Spirit. And He will not lose us. And also this. That idea. Overwhelming odds present no problem for the Lord. And thus, also ultimately, those who belong to the Lord can rely on Him. Let's pray. Lord Father, we thank You for this time that we've had this morning. We thank You for this time in Your Word, Lord. and We thank You that You indeed are faithful and true. Lord, though we ourselves stumble and fall over and again, we become rebellious, We are altogether so often unfaithful. Yet you remain faithful to your word, to your promises. So there is no reason for anyone who believes Jesus to ever feel that they might be lost. Lord, Father, I pray that if we are being rebellious, if we are in sin, Lord, that we would come to You and confess those sins and repent so that we have that restored fellowship and You can then bless us here. We thank You, Lord, that though our salvation doesn't depend on our works, Lord, that our works are not yet forgotten that we can look forward to a reward. Perhaps, Lord, we have that time where we can come before You and lay these things all down at Your feet. Lord, we thank You for who You are. Thank You for who we are in You. Lord, I want to lift up to you those who are sick right now, those who are enduring illnesses or disease. Lord, we ask that you would heal them. Those who have children who are sick, ask that you would be with them and comfort them and heal them as well, Lord. Show us, Father, how we can be a light in our very own neighborhoods, the places where You have placed us, Lord. Give us opportunities to minister and to, to share Your love, and Your compassion. We pray all these things in the name of Your precious Son, Jesus. May the Lord bless You and keep You. May He make His face and His light to shine upon You. May He lift up His countenance upon You. 
and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, it's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior, everyone said. The object of faith is not the gospel, my friend. The object of faith is Jesus. Being at peace with God is, is not automatic because you by nature are separated from God. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we are both sinners. Every person is a sinner and sin, our sin, separates us from God. Sincerity, morality, good works, a religion, these are some of the ways that man has tried to close the gap between himself and God. Only God's love can close that gap of separation between himself and you. He paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The Bible says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle reiterated this in 1 John 2, where we read this, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Because of this, despite the fact that we are sinners, we are not blocked from God and from His kingdom because of our sin. He has removed the sin barrier so that now we are all savable. All we need to do to have everlasting life with God, life that can never be lost, is to believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus very plainly says that whoever believes in Him will not perish but has everlasting life. Because of the cross and the, the resurrection of Jesus, all who simply believe in Him have everlasting life and will one day be raised from the dead to live physically forever in perfect glorified bodies. I can be absolutely sure that I have everlasting life because I know it has nothing to do with how good or bad I am and everything to do with Jesus' faithfulness to His promise. You crossed that bridge into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ. And God invites you to believe and freely receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life that can never be lost.